In the last video, I talked about the idea of the clique problem, which says given a, a large, let's say any size graph uh, whatsoever, uh, does that graph happen to contain, let's say, a clique of a particular size? And, and you know, this particular problem turns out uh, there are no known efficient algorithms for being able to, to make that determination about a graph. And, and, it, and you can start to imagine this graph start to get you know, more complex. Uh, it becomes a lot harder, for example, to make a determination about whether or not uh, you know, that graph happens to have a clique of a particular size. And for example, if you look at a graph like this, you might want to know, does this, does this graph have a, a clique of size 5? And it turns out that you know, I believe this graph, as I drew it, does have a clique of size 5 because these five nodes uh, right here, actually, um, to make clique size 5 in this graph, I'd actually have to, to add a few more edges. Uh, to this to this graph, but you can see that if I have uh, all of these edges and these five nodes form a clique of size five in this graph, and, and as graphs get larger and more complex, uh, it's not hard to imagine that uh, it can quickly become unwieldy to find uh, these cliques of, of any interesting size. Okay, now what's interesting about clique is that it, is it has a very fascinating property, and it's a property that uh, is very relevant in the context of the p versus np problem. It turns out that you can actually take any problem, any problem in NP, and you can transform it. You can take any problem in NP, and you can transform it. You can transform it into an instance of clique. Okay, and, and let me kind of explain what that means uh, at, a, at a more fundamental level. Let me give you an example, actually, so that maybe it's a bit more concrete. Uh, you basically uh, you could actually build a transformer, okay, a transformer, let's, let's call this transformer something from a box, okay, so let's imagine this transformer is a box, okay, and this transformer can take uh, any instance of an NP problem, so for example, let's say it takes an instance of uh, the factoring problem, okay, now factoring, uh, I'm being a bit loose here, is not technically an NP problem because it's uh, uh, not a decision problem, but kind of bear with me, and it turns out this is more or less true, uh, even if we're talking about factoring as a problem. But we can take, let's say, any instance of factoring, and we can efficiently transform it by pushing it through this transformer into an instance of the clique problem. Okay, And when I say that, that means that if you could come up with an efficient algorithm for solving clique, then you can take that algorithm and with some massaging, you can come up with an algorithm that solves the factoring problem. Now, the one big detail I've, I've left out here is, is how you would construct a transformer of this nature. It turns out there are constructions of such transformers. I will not describe those constructions uh, in these videos because they are a bit more involved. Uh, and I think that would, you would lose a lot of the intuition when, when I go into some of the mathematical rigor around how these transformers are constructed. But just kind of take my word for it for now that there is a possibility, there is a mechanism by which you can construct such a very powerful transformer that can actually take an instance of factoring and convert it into an instance of clique such that any efficient solution to clique can in turn be used to construct an efficient solution to the factoring problem. Okay. Now what's actually also interesting about this transformer is that uh, in this particular case for clique and factoring, it's known to go in one direction. In other words, we know how to transform factoring instances into clique instances, but we do not know how to go in the opposite direction. We do not know how to transform clique instances into factoring instances so that any efficient solution to factoring would in turn lead to an efficient solution to clique. Okay? Now, as I mentioned before, um, there is such a transformer. Uh, for any problem in NP, it turns out you can come up with such a transformer that can transform that problem into an instance of clique. Okay, so what that means in a broad sense, and this is hypothetically speaking, of course, if you could solve a clique efficiently, so that is, if you could solve clique in polynomial time, then it turns out you can theoretically solve any problem, any problem in polynomial time. Okay, you can you can take any problem uh, and, and plug it into it and it'll give you a an appropriate transformer, you can take any problem in NP and plug it into an appropriate transformer for that problem, uh, it would transform that problem to clique, then any efficient solution to clique would in turn lead to a solution to the problem that you originally started with. Okay? And I think this is this is pretty amazing 
Uh, and in fact, actually, I do want to point out a couple of things that in, before I talk about why this is so amazing. Uh, so first of all, one nuance here is that, you know, any, these transformations in general, I think the, the really clever part of the transformation is this first part where you, you start off with the initial problem and you convert it to an instance of clique. The, the backwards transformation, the, the transformation where you take the solution to clique and then transform it back to solution to the original problem is often a lot simpler. It's not as as advanced or sophisticated as the, the original direction that you have to go in. Okay, uh, But again, I want to emphasize that this is all hypothetical. We don't know how to solve clique efficiently, uh, but if we could, it turns out we can solve any problem in NP efficiently. These transformers are not hypothetical, but solutions to clique that are efficient, they are hypothetical. Okay, Now, the implications of being able to do something like this are just utterly outstanding. You know, after all, if you have a problem in NP, uh, that means that it's easy to verify its answers. If we can solve clique efficiently, then we'd be saying that any problem, any problem whose answer could be verified efficiently could itself be solved efficiently. Okay, in a sense, then, clique is kind of like this, this uber uh, NP problem. It's like this, this universal NP problem. We actually have a term for this uh, in theoretical computer science. We call problems like this that have this transformer, that, that have this kind of universal nature, we call them NP complete problems. Okay, any problem in NP uh, that has this, this universality problem or any other problem in NP can be converted to that problem such that the solution uh, to, to the NP complete problem will lead uh, to the solution to the original problem. That, that, that's, that, that new problem is then called NP complete. Okay? I realize this is maybe a bit more modeled than, than I would have liked, but hopefully you get the idea that clique has this very, very powerful property. Now it turns out that clique is not unique in that regard. It's not the only known NP-complete problem. There are literally tens of thousands of such problems come up quite naturally in various domains. And in fact, uh, there are NP-complete problems in domains uh, such as obviously computer science. Okay, uh, there are NP-complete problems in in math. Uh, there are also NP-complete problems that come up, for example, in biology. Uh, so, for example, being able to fold proteins, it turns out you can express that as an NP-complete problem. Uh, there are NP-complete problems that come up in physics. Okay, there are NP-complete problems that come up in, in economics. For example, uh, there are some NP-complete problems related to game theory, in, in particular solving certain kinds of, of Nash equilibria in games, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, and there are just so many of, of these remarkable problems out there and this is probably why the P versus NP problem is so interesting because it seems like there are just so many interesting problems out there that are just really hard to solve uh, because they are NP complete. Uh, but at the same time, uh, any of their answers can be verified efficiently. Okay, and they come up in, in so many different domains. Uh, I'll give you some names of, of standard or well known NP complete problems. Uh, so some of the names include things like the, the traveling salesman problem which basically says you have a salesman and, and he has to tra traverse a number of different cities and, and you're given information about um, the cost of going from city to city uh, and, and you want to find out if there's a route that the salesman can take that does not exceed a certain cost. That problem, it turns out, in, in the broadest sense, is an NP-complete problem. Uh, another example of an NP-complete problem is solving a Sudoku puzzle. Uh, Sudoku puzzles you might be aware of, you might have seen them in the newspaper, there are puzzles where you have to basically fill in numbers in different boxes such that uh, the sums in various directions are, or rather not the sums, but, but the, the number of times a particular number or digit is used in a particular direction is, is unique. Uh, it turns out that if you took a generalized version of Sudoku, instead of dealing with, let's say, 10 digits, if you kind of made an n by n uh, version of Sudoku, uh, you would in fact have an NP hard problem. Another example of an NP hard problem is what's called a subset sum problem. Okay, and you can look each of these problems up, and I would encourage you to do that if you're interested. Um, protein folding, as I mentioned before, uh, is another example of an NP hard problem. So these are all instances of NP hard problems. And what I will do in the, in the next video is I will switch gears a little bit and talk about, uh, in a broader sense, what it would take to resolve the P versus NP question.